As the ladies are coming up, I'm going to share a little bit of the background on the song that we're going to sing, which is His Eye is on the Sparrow. And um, Mim chose this one because it was written by a woman. And um, it's noted that Jesus was probably a bird watcher because he frequently referred to bird life in his sermons. Um, you'll recall he mentioned, uh, not one sparrow falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And uh, consider the ravens, and also uh, do not fear you are of more value than the sparrows. It was this theme that caused the author of God Will Take Care of You to write a year later another great hymn on God's care, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Sevilla Durfee Martin was a Canadian by birth, born on August 21st, 1869 in Nova Scotia. She became a school and music teacher, but when she married Dr. Walter Martin, an evangelist, she gave up teaching to travel with him and assist in his meetings. This is her account of the writing of this song. Early in the spring of 1905, my husband and I were sojourning in Elmira, New York. We contracted a deep friendship for a, for a couple by the name of Mr. and Mrs. Doolittle, true saints of God. Mrs. Doolittle had been bedridden for nigh 20 years. Her husband was an incurable cripple who had to propel himself to and from his business in a wheelchair. Despite their afflictions, they lived happy Christian lives, bringing inspiration and comfort to all who knew them. One day while we were visiting with them, my husband commented on their bright hopefulness and asked them for the secret of it. Mrs. Doolittle's reply was simple. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. The beauty of this simple expression of boundless faith gripped the hearts and fired the imagination of Dr. Martin and me. The hymn, His Eye is on the Sparrow, was the outcome of that experience. The day after writing the song, she mailed it to the famous gospel composer, Charles Gabriel, who penned the music. Now you know. <laughs> Jesus is my portion. 
get the tough acts to follow. <laughs> this morning's first scripture reading from the book of Psalms. The 40th Psalm, be reading verses 6 through 10. And if you're using a new church Bible, that can be found on page 508. <clears throat> Again, the 40th Psalm, verses 6 through 10 on page 508. This is a psalm of David, and David writes, Sacrifice and meal offerings you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips. O Lord, you know I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not conceived your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our second, excuse me, our second reading this morning is from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 3 to 9, and it's found on page 912 of the Bible. While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nod, nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? This perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor, and they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. This is the gospel of our Lord. One of the things I failed to mention uh, during my prayer time. Um, so Harold, keep Harold in your thoughts and prayers because Harold's having a difficult week uh, physically and he sees the doctor on Wednesday. Uh, also, uh, speaking of uh, this past week, uh, we went over to the National Monument for the National Day of Prayer on Thursday. Uh, Mark, I know you were there. Uh, I would say, and I don't know, I'm estimating, but we had about, we had uh, around 12, anywhere from 12 to 13 from our church, but I I'm estimating that there was probably, at the height of it, maybe about 450 people. I don't really know. Um, I know that there was a drone overhead. That would give you a better sense. But uh, anyway, it was a great time, 
And for those of you who were there, you know it was a fantastic time. Uh, great speakers, great messages. And uh, I understand, Mark, you, you, uh, you actually f um, Facebook timed it, uh, live streamed it. Uh, and yeah, pretty cool. So, uh, okay, uh, let's, let's, um, let's get to the message. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, may you uh, speak to our hearts with what you've laid upon my heart, and we give this to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, uh, folks, uh, when, when we come to the anointing of Christ in this passage in Mark, uh, few, few passages in all of Scripture capture a heart of love and devotion and one of sacrifice and praise and faith shown to our, our Lord during his earthly life. And now, think about this. Can you name me another passage in all of Scripture that maybe perhaps comes close to something like this. So I, I started to think, and maybe you're too shy to shout something out, but I started to, to think, the 12 disciples never did anything like this. Leave it to the women, right? I started to further think, you know, you go to Matthew chapter 2. The wise men bring gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Absolutely symbolic. You know, you've heard the messages about what they represent. But I've said this in the past. Uh, Jesus is a toddler. He's two. What is he going to do with a bag of gold? Now, I think God used it to help Joseph and Mary get out of Dodge, so to speak, and go to Egypt. The, the, the other thing I thought of, if you turn over to John chapter 20, this is after Jesus died. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, two that were on the ruling council, that is the Sanhedrin, took the body down from the cross and put the body of Jesus in Joseph's tomb. Uh, the scriptures tell us that Joseph was a, a man, a rich man, of great means. Nicodemus, if he was on the council, probably was one of means as well. And, and the scripture says that they took 75 pounds of spices. Now, I don't know what that is in terms of cost. And then they used Joseph's tomb. But... This is, this is my point. This was done after he died. This was not done during his lifetime. And these are great acts of giving and kindness. And, and if you think about it, Nicodemus and, and uh, Joseph defiled themselves before the Sabbath, before the Passover. And very, very honorable. And I'm not... And I'm not using these other examples as points of comparison because I think that that misses the point of the anointing here. But I bring up these things to try to show the uniqueness of this woman's act. This is selfless. This is devotion. This is sacrifice. This is love. This is something that God expects from his people. She touched the heart of Christ here. Did she not? I mean, she meant, this was during his life. I mean, you, you, the, throughout the Gospels, Jesus is always giving. He's always putting out. And, and this act is absolutely like off the charts. And if we reflect on Christian service, there is a lot done in the name of Christ that is not to Christ, and it is not done for Christ. There's a lot done in churches and throughout the world that do not minister to his heart, nor touch his spirit. There is much done that is not done in the spirit today. It's done in the spirit of do good. Right? Now, there's nothing wrong with being a do-gooder and doing good. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of do-gooding may not touch the heart of Christ. And that's my point. 
And, and when you come to Mark's account here, and, and the others as well, uh, Matthew talks about this, um, and John talks about it, uh, but concern was expressed for doing something for the poor. So I want you to think about this. If this vial of nard, this alabaster flask or container, box, whatever they wanna, what you want to call it, if that was given to the poor, that would be a good thing, right? But wait a minute. If that was the outcome, then Jesus would have been left out. And that's the beauty of this. His heart would have not been blessed. And if you notice the account here, he actually praises the woman. He approves of what she did. The, the poor can actually wait. Now, the, the scenario here is leading up to the Passover, all sorts of things were done for the poor. It's not that they were excluded. But Jesus, and he's not saying that he's not concerned about the poor, because you go through all throughout the scriptures, the poor was always in the land, and God is concerned about the poor. But what this woman did was actually better than selling it and giving it to the poor. The poor you're always going to have with you, Jesus said. So doing good is good, but doing good with the motive to bless the heart of God is even better. And I think that that's what comes out of the text here. And, and I want you to gain a, significant, a, a, a sense of how significant his actions, uh, her actions were because Jesus said, that wherever the gospel is preached, and we know that it's going to be preached in every nation before the end comes, right, that her actions will be remembered. Uh, this, this is incredible. Now, if you go over to Matthew's account, Matthew doesn't tell us who the woman is, but if you go over to the gospel of John, John tells us who this woman is. John, John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, John says that it was Mary. Mary, the sister of Martha, and Mary, who is also the sister of Lazarus. Now, you know that Lazarus was raised from the dead. So, this is the same Mary that was sitting at the feet of Jesus when Martha was running around in all sorts of busy and complaining that Mary wasn't helping. And, and what, did, what did Jesus say? Well, Mary chose the better thing. And, and, and this is interesting because if you go over to the, the, the John's account, Martha was running around serving again with this supper that evening. John tells us that Lazarus was there and that it was the home at the home that the 12 disciples were there and it was at the home of Simon the leper. Now, this is also important too to kind of put it in context. John also gives us a sense of the timing of this supper to honor Jesus. John says it was six days before the Passover. So if you work it backwards at John chapter 12, verse 1. So if you actually work it backwards, this was Saturday evening, the Saturday, the evening before Sunday, Palm Sunday, where Jesus was in Bethany, and they threw this honor. Because Jesus came up from Jericho and went into Bethany, and then you would have had the Sabbath. Friday evening to Saturday evening, and then it, at the close of the Sabbath, they would have had this, this supper to honor Jesus. If you read Mark chapter 14, verse 1, don't get the sense that this happened two days before Christ was put to death. Now, back, back to, to Matthew's gospel. I chose Matthew's gospel, I'm sorry, Mark's gospel, because... Mark uses a literary feature, and I want you to see this. Take a look at verses 1 and 2. He points out that they're plotting to kill Jesus, 
And if you skip down to verse 10, he also mentions that Judas Iscariot is involved. And that's important because Mark is using a literary feature here to contrast Mary's actions and the actions of the leadership and the actions of a disciple that is going to betray him. And so her service is set in, in kind of like in the setting of treachery. That's, that's, that's how Mark frames it. Mary's tremendous act of love in the midst of treachery here. And, and, and that's why it's even all the more pregnant, if I, if I can use that expression. And, and when you read this account, uh, what comes out of the heart is what's in the heart. That's what Jesus said, right? And you can see what's coming out of the heart of evil people. And you can see what's coming out of the heart of a godly saint. Uh, what a contrast. And we know from this account that, that Mary's actions were pure and just. Now, uh, she spent a lot of money in about 30 seconds to a minute. I mean, a lot of money. As, as someone said, uh, cost and consequences were just thrown to the wind. She didn't care. Her heart was in it. Now, <laughs> at, at first reading here, if you totally gloss over the heart of Mary, uh, you, you take a look at it and you say, this is radical. This is impulsive. She's not a good steward. This is not very smart. This is not wise. It's kind of reckless. I mean, Judas, in, in, the, in John's account of chapter 12, John chapter 12, Judas quickly calculates how much she spent over a year's wages. So whatever you make in a year, think about it. Maybe you don't put it in the offering plate, but you pour it over your Savior in one minute. That's a lot of money, folks. Did Mary consider the cost? Uh, you take a look at the, the account here. Uh, take a look at verse 4 in Mark. Some of the disciples were indignant. Uh, that word in the Greek literally means to flare the nostrils. <coughs> to get angry, to snort. Do you ever see like the cartoons where, you know, uh, they have the red bull, you know, the bull kind of gets angry and he kind of paws his paws and he gets ready to charge and he turns red and you see smoke coming out of his nostrils. That's kind of what the word means, right? And, and, and so the other disciples are angry at what Mary did. This is, this is stupid. This is brash. This doesn't make any sense. It's a waste. Better spent on the poor. And so what you have here is this wasteful act when you could have had a charitable act. That's what's being presented. <laughs> but that's not the whole picture. The other thing that John tells us, <laughs> let's go back to Judas. Judas. Judas is the one who actually objects to what Mary does. He's the one that calculates how much money she spent in about 30 seconds to a minute. And John goes on to tell us that Judas was a thief. He was stealing from the box. Uh, I could be wrong about this, but I believe that Judas was looking at that and thought, I missed an opportunity. To, she didn't bring it into the treasury, and I missed an opportunity to line my pockets. That was his intent, and that was his motive. Calculating the money. And, and, and here's, here's the other thing, too. Judas led with a, weight of, a wave of criticism, and he swept other people away like gangrene. He started to complain 
and moan, and he gets other people all fired up about how what Mary did was wrong. You know, this is actually like a public scolding, a demeaning somebody, condemning somebody for doing something from their heart. And, and that's the irony of the whole thing. Uh, Mary's heart was in it, and Judas's heart was not. And, 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 and so maybe the proper way to look at this account, Mary unleashes the vial of fragrance, the perfume, and Judas unleashes his poison. Do you ever find yourself in an environment like that? Right? Poison, fragrance. I've said this before. I think we have a poisonous environment today. A lot of poison. Not, not as much fragrance. We need fragrance to be broken that would fill the house. That would fill the communities. That would fill the world. So, Mary makes it about Jesus... And Judas makes it about the poor and the money. The poor. Uh, wasteful in light of other responsibilities, right? And, and what, does, what does Jesus say? She did a beautiful thing. I mean, what is Jesus worth? A year's wage? A day's wage? Ten years worth of wages? I don't think you can put a price on what Jesus is worth. And, and, and so Judas here misled others when it came to appearances. And, and tragically, he judged her heart. She was all in. Uh, here, here's here's, a, here's an, another way to look at this. We have two outlooks here. We have two sets of motives. The earthly view, I'll call the odious view. Because what she did, again, I said earlier, reckless, unwise, seemingly unwise, costly, terrible decision with money, that's the human view. Not very smart. Mary could have spent it better. And then here's the heavenly view, the fragrant view. It was a beautiful act. Uh, what seemed wasteful and odious was fragrant. It, it wasn't wasted at all. And, and if you think about this, because of Mary's actions, she is going to be mentioned wherever the gospel, actually not so much she, because Mark has her unnamed. John gives us the backstory to it. But because of her act, wherever the gospel was preached, this will also be highlighted. And that's, that, that's incredible. So I would say to you, you know, follow your heart. When, when you want to bless God and you, want to, you have devotion to him and, and, and you're led to do something radical, impulsive, on the spur of the moment, to minister to him, to touch his heart, do it. Don't let, don't let the Judases of the world hold you back. The other thing that I, that I thought of here too, you can't, always frame things in the context of money, can we? You know, if you look at this purely from an earthly point of view, and you calculate the money, that's, that's an earthly view. Everything can't always be measured in terms of dollars and cents. I mean, I know, like, you know, we run a church, and you have to kind of run a church like a business in the sense that you have to pay the bills, you have to look at the funds, you know, you want to be good stewards. But from an earthly perspective, this wasn't real good stewardship now, was it? And, you know, I know that you go over into the Gospels and Jesus talked about counting the cost if you're going to build a tower, you know, if you're going to raise an army, that sort of thing. You know, it applies to the material and the spiritual. But if you're looking at this simply like the money, then... You're missing the heart of Mary and the Marys of the world. How many times do we sit around and say, you know, well, it costs money. 
It costs money. It costs more money. Rather than just doing it to the heart of Christ. That's the beauty of the, the sanctuary renovation. I didn't orchestrate it. I sat back and just watched the money come in because it was done to the heart of Christ. And we didn't have to worry about it. Amen? We talked about it, but we didn't wor- I didn't worry about it. Maybe you did. I didn't. I sleep well at night. I really do. If you worry about the money, and by the way, about the money, you go, you go back to the widow's might. Isn't that the point? You know, about the widow's might? Everybody's bringing rich sums of money out of their abundance. And this widow, if you go back a couple chapters in Mark, this widow brings, what, a couple of coins? A one-sixty-fourth of a day's wage, and God honors it. So it's all about motive. It's about sacrifice. It's about the condition of the heart toward God. And that's why this passage is, is incredibly beautiful. It's got everything to do with Mary's actions, her act of service. It's the fruit of love. She gave it out of not abundance, but out of the love of her heart. It's a sacrifice, something she was led to do, something she wanted to do, something she was able to do. There were limitations. She had a pound, but she gave it all. She did it to the full. And, it, and so it wasn't, about, it wasn't about the big show now, was it? You know, some people want you to know how much money they bring into the church, how much money they bring to a project, how much money they spend on God. Uh, this was so far from Mary's thought. Didn't matter to her. She wanted to show love and service to Christ. Take a look at uh, verse 8 here. Uh, she, Jesus said, She has done what she could. Uh, in other words, she did what she was able to do. Now, this is important. This is not general doing. Uh, the expression here in the phrase, the context, the understanding is she did something special, unique, specific, out of the abundance of her heart. She was moved to do it. This is not something that you do weekly. This is something very, very special. And, and here's the other thing. If you go back to uh, verse 3. It, the scripture says, she broke the vial. Now, the point in breaking the vial here is that it could never be used again. She poured it all out. She didn't hold anything back. It was all used up. And, and Mark tells us that she poured it on his head, but John tells us that she poured it on, her, on his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And so she, she anointed his entire body. And, and, and I would suggest to you that this is the picture. This is an act of worship. She did not hold back. She gave her all. She gave her very best, the best ointment. There was no thought to the cost. And Mary was all in with Jesus. And I think that that's the message that comes out of this text. Uh, were her actions radical? Yeah. But were they reckless? No. I think Mary was very calculating. I don't think she cared about the cost in terms of money, but I think she was very calculating. Now, you tell me if this is not the heart of God in Mary's heart. All in, doesn't hold back, doesn't count the cost, and gives it all up. That's the heart of God. Mary, Mary was a godly woman. And, and you know, I, I'm re- reflecting on this because it, it's so easy, it's so easy to give um, the educational side of the text. But I, I think that this is the heart 
that God looks for in his people. All in, sold out, giving one's best, not holding back. And you know, we, we all hold back a little bit, don't we? We all hold back. I, I think Mary was very, very calculating and deliberate, and very, very deliberate. Um, take a look at verse 3 again. He was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table. They were already at the table. Now, in, this is important. This is why I think Mary was calculating. Because in this culture, when men were reclining at the table, either you served the table or you didn't approach the table. But Mary deliberately approaches the table and she broke social etiquette. She knew exactly what she was doing. And she got criticized for it. Do you ever, you ever do something, you know exactly what you're doing? You're all in. You're doing it with all your heart. Uh, only to have somebody give you a hard time to be critical, to undermine, to demean you, to show anger, to be dismissive of your motives. Yep. <laughs> what is Mary's response? Crickets. She doesn't say anything, right? What did Solomon say? Is it time to speak? <laughs> time to be silent, right? And this is really, really beautiful here. Uh, I love that fact that Jesus comes to her defense. Because she's a woman in that society. And you know that they didn't always have the social status that women have today. And what he does here. He, he points out that her act here was more symbolic than what meets the eye. There's nothing wasteful or reckless. He goes on to say that she has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Now, uh, when you take a look at verse 8, the phrase, she did what she could, she, she, did, she has done what she could. I failed to mention to you that this, this is a sense that Mary made the most of the opportunity. That's important. So it, it actually begs the question now, did Mary sense the uniqueness of the occasion when others lacked it? Remember, this is the woman that sits at the feet of Jesus. Uh, is this what the Lord is saying here? That Mary sensed the occasion? Did Mary uh, anoint Jesus knowing full well that this was her last opportunity to bless him before he died? You know, you know how we look at circumstances and events and sometimes we say, oh, that's really cool. Oh, that's really, what a coincidence. It's never a coincidence, right? It's always providence. The question is this. Was this general providence where Mary broke the vial and something came out of her heart here, but she didn't really know? In other words, she did it unconsciously, unknowingly, unsuspectingly? It's, it's a possibility. If you go over to the other Gospels, did not Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, prophesy? Here's a wicked man, and he speaks a word from God, so to speak, that it would be profitable for one to die for the nation. Have you ever had a wicked person actually counsel you with some good counsel? I have. And I've actually had believers give me bad counsel. You don't know. You've got to listen. So, so here's the thing. If, if Mary did this unconsciously and unsuspectingly and unknowingly, then everyone is blind here in this situation. 
they're, they're clueless as to what's going to happen in a week. But others see this as more than a just a like kind of like a prophetic impulse. Mary made the most of the opportunity because she realized what was at stake. Jesus' hour had come. And so if that's the case, then while the others are blinded, she saw it all. Uh, remember, what did Jesus say in the Gospels? I'm going to go to Jerusalem to die. The, the disciples are always presented as spiritually dim-witted, not really plugging in, not taking Jesus at face value. I, I think it's probably proper to take the, Jesus at face value. I think that's what she did. I think she understood what was happening. Now, not too far from being done. Where did Mary get all this money? Because she's not rich like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. She's, she's um, an average person, maybe even less than average, in the town of Bethany. A town where they had a leper colony. Where did she get it? Uh, some actually think that this was an heirloom, and I'm inclined to believe that that was the case. This is what I think. I think that Mary properly sensed the timing of the occasion for Christ's burial, death and burial. And she took that precious heirloom, precious, worth a lot of money, and she gave it up for family. That's what she did. She responded accordingly, and it was a selfless act. And when we read the Gospels, the 12, they're three sheets to the wind. They're not plugging in. Now, I don't like the stereotype, but it's been my experience that women are generally better listeners than men. I'm not exactly sure if that's instinctive, if it's learned behavior, or what? But my wife's a better listener than I am. And I know that some women in here are better listeners than their husbands and men. I've seen it. Not stereotyping, but. And this is what I think. I think Mary, that, you know, that, that sixth sense that women have? I think she plugged into the moment of like, oh my goodness. He's coming to die. And I'm not going to have him around anymore. And I don't know that she totally understood the resurrection part. But, you know, because that, when you go to the tomb, you know, Mary's, you know, at a loss as all the others are. But I, I think she plugged in. And she gave it up because Jesus was family to her. Now, it's Mother's Day. Scripture tells us nothing about whether Mary was a mother or not. But this is, this is motherhood instinctive likeness, if you will. And, and, and she pours out her heart in the moment, her entire soul in the moment. It's her last opportunity. She's extremely grateful for what God has done for her her sister, her brother, and Simon the leper, her friend at the very least. Some think that it's her brother-in-law, Martha's husband. Some think it might be Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' father. We don't know. But I, th I think Mary's heart is full. She's blessed. And it I'm just going to do what I need to do, and I don't care what people think. Can you relate to that? I 
Actions speak louder than words, and I think that this action said it all. I think it basically was saying, I love you, Jesus. That's what I think it was. Uh, two more points very, very quickly, if I can. Um, the perfume. <laughs> this is uh, kind of interesting, but it, it's acceptable on a dead body, it's not acceptable on a male who's alive. So I want you to think about this. Corpse, okay. Living person, not. This is taboo, right? It's a sign, if you walk around, guys, with lots of perf, like women smelly perfume, what do you think? Does that kind of work for you? Someone said, this is a sign of effeminacy. In other words, for the possibly leading up to the cross, Jesus walked around with all this perfume. And he smelled like somebody who would put a lot of perfume on. And you know something? If you doused me, I don't know. What's, what's, the, what's the woman's, uh, big woman's perfume? Chanel 5 or something like that, right? Chanel 5. If you douse me with Chanel 5, I'd probably give you a knuckle sandwich if I had to carry it around all week. And, and it, it doesn't seem to bother Jesus at all. If, ladies, if I doused you with English leather, a guy's cologne, how would you feel? Pretty upset, right? This is amazing. It's probably quite possible that Jesus smelled of this perfume all the way to the cross. Because, you know, in our culture, you know what we do? We run home, take off the clothes, we take a real quick shower, right? In this culture, running water, you know, it, it's involved, right? And, and, you know, think about that in your hair. You don't get rid of it. And, and you know what's amazing? Is Christ is not even embarrassed at all. Does anything really embarrass God when you do it for him from the depths of your heart? I, I don't think so. I do not think so. He commended her, he defended her, and he honored her because she honored him. One final thought. It's Mary's action, not Mary, that's memorialized forever. It was never about Mary. It's always about Jesus. It was about Jesus back then. It's about Jesus today. Listen to what somebody wrote as I close. For over 2,000 years, the Lord Jesus carried the aroma of Mary's gift the fragrance that once filled the house has filled the world. Oh, that we might catch the spirit of her amazing service. I think that that's it, folks. You know, when we catch it, we carry that fragrance wherever we go. Fills the house, fills the world, fills the community, fills our, our, the marketplace, fills the job place. That's the picture. That's what Mary did. Uh, why? Because she loved Jesus and she was all in. She didn't hold back. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I struggle because I hold back. But yet, I also find that when I don't hold back, I don't struggle as much. You ever notice that? Correlation? Anyway, but that's what God has laid upon my heart this morning. I I, I hope it blesses your heart, uh, and uh, I hope and pray that uh, the fragrance of that Holy Scripture comes off uh, the pages and uh, is, is transforming in terms of how we um, look at motives, actions, <coughs> count money, and not really get to the bottom of the whole thing that when it's done to Jesus, it's precious. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, 
uh, thank you uh, for this passage of scripture. Uh, thank you for Mary's actions. May uh, we embrace them. May uh, what Mary did be ours in, in substance and in motive uh, of heart and soul. Uh, again, we bless you for this time. Uh, we bless you, uh, again, for our moms and uh, our mothers, um, our wives, and how they're a sweet fragrance in, in our homes. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.